Welcome to the Latrobe Valley Common Law Assembly. We are a group of people that have united over issues that affect each and every one of you here tonight. We have embraced a motto of the common law where we do no harm, loss, damage or injury. Tonight, you're going to hear from our men's group that formed recently over issues that have been put forward to them by our members. Currently, we have 180 members on our books. That's not bad for a group that's only been going for about nine months. <clears throat> My name is Carleen Haylock and I am your convener for the Tro Valley Common Law Assembly. The topic of discussion tonight is what is happening to our waterways. It's about raising a problem that is in our beautiful Gippsland waterways and what reaction each of you will have once you have heard from our speakers tonight. We are looking for solutions. Latrobe Valley Common Law Assembly will be pressuring this until we have a resolution that is beneficial for all Gippslanders. I would like to welcome our guests that have been invited, Morgan, Avi and Rushkin. Thank you for coming down tonight. <clears throat> and all of our political parties and our three, oh no, we actually had four mayors that were invited from East Gippsland, the Trobe City, Bawble, Shire and Wellington and none of them are showing up tonight. You will hear and see some confronting and emotional information tonight. We are non-apologetic as this issue is important to all here and to provide the action. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all of those that are involved, the people behind me and Jeremy and others in getting this presentation together. A lot of thought and time has been involved for tonight's proceedings. So let's begin. I would like to introduce um, one of our core members tonight and that is Colin Brown. Thank you, Carleen, and thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for turning up here tonight. I just probably want to touch on a bit of myself, my family, myself. Um, basically, uh, back in 91, um, I started a business in Trafalgar. It was called Trafalgar Diesel Service. So I basically had a small business with a young family on the way. And as our, 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 our time went on, we worked in abattoirs and we actually helped Thorpedale area that was very, very heavily in the spuds, onions and carrots. Irrigation, diesels, all sorts of things we worked on. Just getting away from that, um, basically uh, I took on a family's farm the same year that I started this business. Um, up in Mundara, which is a township of uh, Gould. Uh, my grandfather had sawmill stuff. He had dairy farms, 680 acres. Um, and honest to God, they worked hard on the land um, from cutting timber to milking cows. And my grandfather used to actually go to the farm, milk the cattle, but he had a blacksmith shop there. And he actually built everyone's axes, picks, shovels, a whole lot. Getting back to that, I had a great uncle. Basically, uh, I lived with this man. He come all the way from Queensland after being up there with his uh, sister and his uh, son-in-law and said, I hate the heat, I'm going back to Victoria. All of a sudden, he landed on me mum and dad's doorstep with three suitcases at 85 years of age. But he had trucks in the old township of Gould. He had three of them. He carted vegetables, gravels and sands, animals, anything all the way down to Maui to get onto the V-line line to go to the market, down in the Victorian market. And he actually did that as a contractor for other people. With that fella, I learnt lots from uh, about 81 through to about 87 when he passed on of how my father did cross-cut sawing with him. 
and my father basically worked with his men. Um, as the time went on, in the early 50s, my father managed to farm with his own father. They chipped thistles and ferns, and then along come a, another uncle, which his name was Uncle Stan. He was 10 years younger. But around about 1952, they ended up with the first lightning steel chainsaw. And all of a sudden, the government sent everyone a letter in the area and said that we uh, are going to buy all your land and we're going to build a dam in the Mundara Dam. It was called the Mundara Reservoir. So in that time, Jack and Stan, my father Jack and Stan, my uncle, said to all the farmers, well, if you're only getting paid for the land, let's get rid of all the trees. We'll take the trees for royalty, we'll send them all down for paper, down to the Australian paper mill, down him all. And if they're not paper, they're going to go for logs. We'll use it for timber. So that went on, and all of a sudden the dam went in, and my grandfather and grandmother removed themselves from Munda off Browns Road. So my father got a great idea and he said, I'm going to buy that block just up the other end, what the Mundara Reservoir don't want anymore. So he brought a bush block and he cleared the first 15 acres with Stan. They blew stumps out of the ground and then all of a sudden the farmers come along and said, oh, we'll put some spuds in there. So they put spuds and now it's a 100 acre farm with a beautiful river that runs through it. Now getting back to it, Stan and Jack went off up to the mountain and they actually started falling timber off Mount Erica. In that time, they had the state mill do the first ABC documentary on Timber Town in 1964. The 60s went on, and all of a sudden, Jack turned around to stand and said, oh, it's pretty hard in the bush in the snow. And if anyone really wanted to look at some, have a look at Timber Town, 1964 on ABC. It's an absolute unbelievable bit of documentary of Erica and my uncle and my father. Falling timber in the snow. But anyway, it got that tough. They thought, well, there's a job at the Thompson Dam, Jack says to Stan. And he goes, take it. You might as well take it. We've been cutting these logs too much up here. So my father, Jack, took the dam job at the Thompson Dam. So he knew the area from hunting with Stan and hunting and fishing. And he got the job just like an overseer, and off he went. And basically, all of a sudden, he's got a job over on the Blue Rock Dam. So I've seen the Thompson Dam now, I've seen the Blue Rock Dam, and now I've seen the actual Mundara Dam around a farm that my father's cleared. But the best of things with Jack and Stan, that they went hunting and shooting every weekend. My father and Stan were in the ADA, Later on in the 80s, I went in the ADA and I got out of it and I went to the field and game. But I'm telling you now, you just need to watch this movie. It only goes for a short time, but I want to dedicate it to Jeremy over there. He's helped me so much putting this together in the last two months. But the movie's going to tell it all. And I will ask one question after this show. Um, and I'd like the public to actually think about it and I'd like the actual MPs of our sitting MPs think about it as well, and I'd like a response. So, uh, all the best. Here we are at Mundara. What makes up this little community in Mundara is about a dozen community farms. We've got beef farms. We did have dairy back here. We've basically got organic blueberry farm. We've got vineyards. We had potatoes. We had fruit and veggie around here. But the reason why I'm here is I am the third generation here. In 1959, my grandparents were removed from Browns Road for the Mundara Dam to go in. And it was built basically for water, for Latrobe Valley, to go down to their Australian paper mill but it's also being used for Victorian waterways as in drinking water. And I'm gonna expose something that I would like the whole of Victoria, whole of Australia to know what our government systems are doing 
to some of our waterways at the present moment. Basically, I'm only 50 metres from my boundary property just across there. I'm in Gippsland Waters catchment area. On the 21st of April this year, I was rang and asked that they're going to do some aerial spraying over a adjoining property right next door to me. And the aerial spraying was going to be done with Grunt 750. It's a granulated grunt chemical that basically wipes out everything bar a pine tree. This grunt is a absolute devastation to anything such as gum tree, as I'm hanging on to several of them right here, okay? And they use it in the actual forestry area around pine plantations. But I just want to address to people, I'm in a catchment area called the Mundara water catchment area. And I want to touch on that because uh, I'm the third generation on this farm. And basically my grandparents were brought out in 1959 to remove themselves off a 680 acre dairy farm, only one and a half kilometers across the other side of my farm. They were paid out by the actual government to remove themselves for a water catchment, a water catchment area, okay? They didn't want animals, they didn't want, didn't want public life, and they didn't want people around a water catchment area. So this, this property that I'm standing on is Francis's farm. Anyone can actually see that it was originally once upon a time a farm and then they've grown pine trees in it via the Moondara Dam. The Moondara Dam was taken over by Gippsland Water back in the day and they are doing this in our waterways with Grunt 750. It states in their data sheet not to actually use it on undulating ground more than 20 degrees well, I can tell you, anyone who wants to come in here and look at this ground, this is a lot more than 20 degrees undulating, okay? We've got Jacob's Creek just here, only around about 200 metres from where I'm standing. So this is the stuff that they're actually doing to use people in the public, using fertilisers to get the trees to come up out of the ground in a water catchment area, and then we're going to use poisons to poison our native trees. Our native trees are actually dying because of the poison. These trees are valuable. This is Australian. This, gum trees, silver top, stringy bark, your white gums, your snow gums, the whole lot. But now I'm gonna walk you down the hill only 100 meters, which we're gonna be only about 100 meters from your waterways. And I'm gonna show you what else you're doing, people. So here I am, only about probably 200 meters, if that, maybe 150 meters from my own farm and I stumbled across this about a week ago. And uh, it's basically uh, not the only one, there's about half a dozen of them. This sort of stuff has boiled my blood because I've never ever shot anything unless I use it. A rabbit I eat, a deer I'll eat, but I'll tell you, this is disgusting because all this matter is leaching down this hill that's well and truly over 25 to 30 degree grade and it's going straight into the Jacobs Creek and straight into the Moondara Reservoir for the Latrobe Valley people to drink. I just want to touch on this sign here, Poisoning of Wild Dog Control Program. The reason why they actually are doing a wild dog program is because they shoot all the feral animals and they're not just feral. Some of them are deer, some of them are kangaroos, some of them are Australian species, our wallabies, the whole lot. They kill everything off their pine plantations, these people. But this is their next little piece that they actually fix our farming problem up. They start using 1080 for wild dog program. We wouldn't have the wild dogs if they didn't leave the deer, roos, wallabies, all that sort of stuff behind. But they actually shoot them and let them rot in our waterways. But they also put 1080 in their water catchment areas for their wild dog program. So one minute they're justifying their pine plantations. They ridicule us as farmers, but now they actually put 1080. And I think we're one of the only countries that still use 1080. 1080 is proven as cancer causing, and wherever the baits are, it does not remove itself out of the ground. So you can go back there 20 years, 15 years, and it's still there, 1080. Now I can actually take you around my property they actually put this around my property everywhere for their wild dogs. The thing is, I don't believe in this. It's more poison inside our waterways. One minute they're, they're killing animals and next minute we're poisoning animals. So this is a way that they try and help the farmers. I don't know if it's the right way because they're poisoning the land now. They're poisoning it where they set the baits. So I just wanted to point this out. This is only 
10 metres from my boundary property. You can spin around with the camera and just have a look at my fence line right there. It's uh, only within 10 metres to 15 metres of my farmland. So this is the sort of thing that the government sectors, MPs again, please start to realise what we're doing in our community areas. Um, because I'm dead set against this sort of stuff. I'd rather get me gun out and shoot the wild dog, which I've been doing for nearly uh, 40 years of uh, running this farm. Here we are, 50 metres on the lamb side of basically Francis's dairy farm. It was a dairy farm back in the 50s before they kicked everyone out of here for the Moondara Reservoir. The Moondara Reservoir is water for Latrobe Valley, Gippsland. And I'm, I'm 50 metres from where there's a half a dozen to four or five dead deer carcasses on top of the hill done by a professional shooter, labelled that they're looking after their pine plantation. Well, they look after their pine plantation with fertilisers put underneath their pines. They also aerial spray with herbicides and poisons that has been basically done across the top of this hill of 300 acres of pine plantations. So we're not just growing pines, we're poisoning the ground as well. They're farming the ground with fertilisers but we've got a blue and green algae all the way down the Lake Wellington, all, all the way to the lake's entrance during the summer. Well, I'm gonna tell you, ministers, and I'm not gonna bag any minister, because we need yous, but yous need to start to stand up for our Victorian wildlife and for what yous are doing to our wildlife and our waterways. And I do believe our Latrobe Valley water is linked to the Tarrigo all the way down to Warrigal. And they can bring the Tarrago water all the way back to, Mer to, to La Trobe Valley. So tell me, if we're doing this sort of thing inside closed doors in your water catchments, what are we trying to do outside on our farms to stop the actual sprays, stop our fertilizers, and stop our cattle getting in the creeks, but use it doing this sort of thing as a government consortium in our waterways? And all I can say is this, this water fed dairy cattle 60 years ago, and now use a feeding with dead animals, herbicides, and fertilizers. And that's all I've got to say. It's about time you've all started to get your heads together and start to act, such as the EPA, such as our Victorian wildlife representatives, such as our poisons and sprays, such as our Borbore Shire and Latrobe City Shire. Get together and stop this rot inside our community, because use people are what are causing our problem with our poisons and our sprays. Look, I'd like to really thank the AINN -N, in conjunction with the AFIPN for basically going out of their way to film this. I'd like to see this uh, go right around Victoria and Australia because uh, when it all boils down, the MPs of this country are running us and the MPs need to get onto this because it's all behind closed doors. And I'm just hoping that you take it all on board because we need cleaner, greener and better clean water for our community. Thank you very much. Rightio, pretty touching. Um, it's been touching me for about 32 years. This week it's 32 years since my father died. I got one question to the public, one question to the MPs that are running us, and I'd like it answered. Where's the fish gone out of our streams? Because there's no fish, they're gone. Well done, Carl, well done. Uh, g'day, I'm Brett Golding, um, part of the Trove Valley Common Law Association. I'm a local business owner. We employ up to 25, 30 people during the year. Uh, we own a construct, concrete construction company. We do bridges and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, I'd just like to touch base on a few things. Um, Crown land is for the benefit of the whole community. What really sparked me up straight away was that they're selling off farmland for the farmers, kicking them off it, and it looks like they're reselling the land again to, f to farm trees off it. You know, there's a bit of a conflict of interest there, I think. Um, what is HVP Plantation? Well, they're an Australian and Canadian superannuation company. And how did they get involved in Crown land? How can they commercially grow pine plantations on Crown land? HVP state a commitment to zero harm as a part of their guiding, guiding mission and to comply with legislative requirements. Yeah, well, there's a lot, no, there's a lot more than zero harm going on there, we can see. 
Some Air HVP have been granted access to Crown land either as a leaseholder or a freehold. I really think we should start questioning these things and um, have some answers. How and why a private company permitted to use Crown land and profit? HVP's mission statement claims balancing the needs of their employees, customers and local communities. Well, what are we getting out of it? Who has allowed the Crown land to be used for private companies to profit off? If there is financial benefits back at the end user, the public, where is it reflected? Is it in our water bills? We don't see it. Who is currently actually benefiting from the money generated from the pine plantations and how does it benefit Victorians? Well, I think we, there's a lot of questions to be answered here. <laughs> Pass over to Rick. I'm Rick Nicholson and I'm made of coals. And the first time I heard of Grunt, because probably most of you here haven't even heard of Grunt, was on the Freedom Weekend, where the day before we were going to have about 100 people camp there. They, uh, the Gippy Water said they were going to spray Grunt, which we didn't know anything about, but Cole said, no, this is a poison. So he rang his mates, he rang the guy, Mel Deverson, at the Organic Blueberry Farm, the winery fellow, and through a quick few calls, they managed to stop it. But they still did continue at a later date. So we started to do some investigation of what Grunt was, because I'd never heard of it. And if we can have a look at the safety sheet, you can see here right from the start, it says to not to be used near waterways, dams, or anything sewers. We can see these are the things advising not to use it. Now, I don't know whether you can read all those, but it's do not, do not, do not, do not. There is so much there. And if we go back one sheet, Jeremy, to here, we see it's actually a herbicide, and it's called hexazonine. So we thought, okay, what's hexazonine? There's actually a company in America that goes through and studies all these herbicides for what they are and their value or their damage. And this is the company here. And what they've said with, with hexazonine is the average half-life of hexazonine in soils is 90 days, but it can sometimes be found into runoff to six months after an application. So we have questions about this Grunt 750. And I know after tonight, everyone will know what Grunt 750 is and what we should be doing to stop it. The thing was, it does kill everything but one thing, which is the pine plantations. So here's HBV making these pine plantations. And the only thing left are these little saplings. But we have the wild deer coming in there. We have kangaroos. We have all sorts of animals looking for food and that's their only food they've got in this area and what do we do with that? That's another question. I'll hand you over to Max. Hi guys, uh, Max Hill's my name, local guy, I've been here since the late 80s and I'm uh, working for myself these days. First of all I'd like to um, state a uh, very big thank you to Cole and Ange for their courage to bringing this forward to us. Thank you very much. Till date, contract shooters have been the solution until now for Gippsland Water and HPV. Both aerial and ground shooting is being funded by the Victorian Government. This happened in East Gippsland after the fires, where they're culling deer from helicopters. And we've, no, we've now learnt uh, it's also taking place in other uh, water catchments as well around Victoria and probably elsewhere through the country. According to the EPA, all dead stock near watering points, bores, waterways or wetlands need to be properly removed. The legislation requires for farmers to bury dead animals 300 mil below soil. Carcass burial should not occur within 100 metres of any bore or waterway. According to EPA, dead stock should be sent to a knackery or rendering plant for reuse or to an appropriately licensed landfill for disposal, as outlined in Industrial Waste Guidelines for Farm Waste Management, IWRG641, is the reference. I have a statement uh, from a couple of young guys that I, I uh, interviewed on the weekend, and they've told us that uh, contract shooters are being used up there and they met them. So you'll hear in this statement that silences are being used, which is uh, suppressors, which are quite illegal for anyone to possess in the state, and probably anywhere in Australia for that matter. Incorrect disposal, health hazards through potential con contamination, and the attraction of wild dogs, and finally the use of 1080 to control the wild dogs that come in to eat the damn deer. What's going on, you might ask. So if I, if I may, I'll read this statement out in its entirety to you, but I will redact the uh, names and addresses, please. Both gentlemen are known to myself, and they state, 
or one of the gentlemen state. I am a friend of Colin Brown and his wife and I have their permission to shoot vermin including rabbits, foxes and wild dogs and deer including Samba and fellow deer on their farm in Mundara. I have written permission from them. On Tuesday 24th of May 2020 I was with my friend of an address known to Max Hill, that's me, and we were shooting Colin's property located on Browns Road, Mundara. The property is bounded on the southern side by the Mundara Reservoir run by Gippsland Water. To access Colin's property, we first need to enter a Gippsland Water gate, which is locked. Colin has supplied me with a key for access at my discretion. There are several locks daisy chained together and only one of the locks is Colin's. I assume the other two locks belong to Gippsland Water. At about 9 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. that night, we had entered the gated area, which is the normal way to access Collins Farm. We were hunting for deer on Collins Farm when we saw headlights coming out of the bush towards Collins Farm access gate from the pine plantation on the other side of the track. After seeing the light of this car, my friend and I decided we should go and see what the vehicle was doing in there, as there has been damage caused and cattle go missing in the past and given the time of night we felt it could only be a poacher. There are no other houses or private properties anywhere else inside the gated area. We left Collins Farm and waited near the track side, near the track inside the pine plantation and waited for the car to come to us. There is nowhere else it could go. We got into position and waited a couple of minutes for the car to get to where we were. Once he had arrived we got out of the car and approached his driver's door. He remained in the car, which was a white 79 series Toyota Land Cruiser 4x4 tray. I'm pretty sure it was a dual cab. I immediately said, excuse the language, what the fuck are you doing here? He said, contract shooter. In here doing during the day and shooting on contract at night. I said, did you get any? He said, yeah, three. We had a further general conversation uh, once I realized that he wasn't a poacher as such and had a reason to be in there. He gave me his name, but I forgot it. It was clear to me that he was a decent fellow just doing his job. I do not recall the exact words he used, however, he explained the role of his shooting contract. I was inter interested in becoming a contract shooter myself, so I had a decent conversation with him. He told us that it was a contract that he had held for 20 odd years. He did not state if it was HVP or Gippsland Water that had contracted him. I asked him if he was using a suppressor, otherwise known as a silencer, because we had been there a while and had not heard any shots fired, yet he stated that at the start of our conversation that he had shot three deer that night. He said yes. I asked him what he does with the meat. He said that he doesn't take the meat and that he was not allowed to take it. He said that he was contracted to leave the animals where they fell, cut the guts out of them and splay the legs, all four legs. I assume that the carcass is opened up so, to, so as to allow it to rot down more quickly. He told me that the silencer was more trouble than it was worth as it counts the shots and he has to write down every shot fired through the silencer. After the contract shooter left, my friend and I drove down the track and I used my thermal image monocular to find the three carcasses. We only found two of them and I saw the stomach had been opened and that the four legs had been splayed. By splayed I mean that the legs had been cut around but were not removed. My friend took a photograph of one of those two deer carcasses at 10.17pm that night. The statement is signed and I assure you this gentleman is authentic. These questions come to me, is the running of a pine plantation in a public water catchment area uh, the responsible thing to do. Our exposing these matters today now puts Gippsland Water and HPV on notice to correct these dangerous and arguably irresponsible practices within a public water catchment. Gippsland Water has a duty of care to remedy to these practices which in no way reflects the clean, green, responsible corporate citizen that they claim to be. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name's Paul Mack. I'm a veteran and a member of uh, the Shrove Valley Common Law Assembly. I'd like to talk about 1080. What is 1080? Compound 1080, sodium fluoroacetate, is a restricted Schedule 7 poison and there is no known antidote. It has been used extensively to kill pest species such as foxes, 
rabbits and wild dogs. 1080 is toxic to all living species, including microbes, plants, insects, birds and humans. And because birds will eat from the carcasses, it will kill them. In mammals, it causes birth defects, reduced fertility and damage to the reproductive system, brain, heart and other organs. It is still used in Australia, Israel, Japan, Korea, Mexico and New Zealand. It is banned in most countries, including the US, and it was outlawed in the early 1970s because of civilian deaths. When the animals eat the poison baits, they become thirsty and will often die by the water. The only way to remove the poison from the water is through reverse osmosis, which is not feasible on this scale. Do you really think this poison should be in our water catchment areas? Thank you very much. Peter McKay, I've had a long career as a civil engineer and predominantly in water resources and water infrastructure. So, who is Gippsland Water? Vic Catchments is the overarching body of which Gippsland Water is a part of. Gippsland Water is operated by a board of directors with the Victorian State Government as a shareholder. It supplies fresh, clean drinking water to more than 70,000 customers in Gippsland and across an area of more than 5,000 square kilometres. Gippsland Water is required to report to the State Minister for Water, Harriet Singh, annually. The reports indicate that our water quality needs are not questioned due to compliance with water quality regulations. Gippsland Water states they are a leader in safety, public health and the environment to support a healthier community. MyWaterFilter.com has stated that Victoria has one of the highest levels of sediment and rust in Australia, let alone the questionable presence of herbicides. There's an old saying, doing things right versus doing the right thing. In my opinion, objective-based regulation requires greater experience, integrity and assessment to ensure doing the right thing is achieved. In my opinion, for years now, regulations have been progressively moving from an objective base to a more prescriptive base. This is allowing easier positive compliance because you only have to be doing things right and there are no further questions. I'll finish with this question. Particularly with regard to water quality, is current annual reporting which is compliant to regulation sufficiently adequate to support the statement of a leader in safety, public health and the environment to support a healthier community? Thank you. Good evening everybody, my name is Noel Blundell. I'm a member of the Latrobe Valley Common Law Assembly. I'd like to read out a few notes. This is a concern for all of us. Clean fresh water is essential for health, which includes our flora and our fauna. The question now is how to respond to the problem. Solutions come about in steps and a group such as this is the first steps towards a solution. In recent times, we've seen headlines about the increased numbers of people with dementia, rise in cancer cases, and predictions of increases of those numbers. There has been little research conducted into herbicide microdosing of our population. Although multi-million dollar payouts for those suffering from pesticide and herbicide injuries are commonplace. Many of those cases are starting to be heard in Australia. Incidents of disasters relating to leaks into water supplies are common. With the Cornwell, England water disaster, cases of Erin Brockovich, to a little more closer to home, Royal George in North East Tasmania in 1988, Tangaluma Resort in Brisbane in 2019, and Catherine in the, water, uh, in the Northern Territory in 2022. The incident in uh, Catherine resulted in a landmark class action, consequently a $15 million heavy metal filtration system has been installed, which is a world first. The issues relating to catchment processes of our water are many, hence the many aspects to a solution. A resolution of this problem is for all of us to take some responsibility and those in key positions to act. The first significant issue that stems from these incidents is the confusion as to who is responsible. I think we're all responsible. 
The issues raised tonight are multifaceted, including the use of Crown land for private company profits, the use of herbicides in our water catchment areas, the inappropriate culling and disposal of our wildlife, the ongoing contamination of our fresh water, and the unknown consequences associated to that. These issues need to be urgently addressed and the progress towards their, their resolution recorded. Each of you attending tonight hold a small piece of the solution and your input is encouraged. I thank you all. Over the last couple of years, you may have heard that we are been looking for strong men to stand up I can't be more proud right now as the convener of the Tro Valley Common Law Assembly and also the co-convener of the Cairns Common Law Assembly to be standing up here in front of these strong men behind me. Can you please applaud these men? <laughs> I have a motto that I speak each meeting, and that is, how much skin are you prepared to put into the game? If you sit back and expect a different outcome without your input, do not expect it to happen. So don't sit on your backsides right now and think, oh, that was a very interesting uh, conversation that we had. We are the solution. So guys, thank you very much. If you're driving long distance tonight, please drive safely. And I hope that we can see you back in a fortnight. Thanks, everyone.